Welcome everybody to today's webinar, The Main Tech Economy at the Bicentennial. It's part of our state's Bicentennial Celebration Programming. I'm Glenn Cummings, I'm the president of the University of Southern Maine, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome our co-host and the visionary of today's program, David Shaw. David abandoned his other career plans and plunged into the adventurous and fulfilling world of tech entrepreneurship by founding IDEX Laboratories in 1983. Inspired by entrepreneurship and the game-changing science of our times, he has now helped build more than a dozen science-based organizations that generate billions of dollars of annual value to benefit their stakeholders and communities, including Maine. I'm also proud to mention that David is the recipient of two degrees in the University of Southern Maine. He earned his uh, MBA here from USM and received an honorary doctorate of humane letters from USM in 2015. And as will soon become evident, David is also an accomplished filmmaker. Shortly in this program, we'll be treated to the premiere of his latest work, Maine's Tech Economy at the Bicentennial. David, welcome and thank you for co-hosting and bringing the vision of today's program to life. We're delighted that you have assembled an amazingly accomplished and innovative group of entrepreneurships and thought leaders uh, throughout Maine and beyond uh, and major players in Maine's tech industry over the last few decades. And certainly it has helped us position Maine into the future, which is the topic of our discussion. Before we introduce our panelists, uh, David, could you just tell us a little bit about what inspired you to, to develop today's program and the focus of today's discussion? Thanks, Glenn. Uh, yes, I'd love to do that. The idea uh, for this program emerged from discussions regarding important themes to celebrate about uh, Maine in this bicentennial year. Uh, of course, there are many compelling things on that list and the health of our economy is, 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 is one of those. Uh, it's of great interest because it impacts the well-being of Maine and Mainers. Uh, as someone who's now spent decades uh, in Maine's new tech economy, I know that there's an awareness of a, of a growing number of entrepreneurial companies here, but a full picture of the size and scope of that sector has perhaps been elusive and, and maybe misunderstood. Uh, I also sometimes sense that the mega trends that, uh, driving that sector need to be emphasized. Uh, this is the, a golden age of entrepreneurship. Uh, we're living, I believe we're living in the greatest period of scientific discovery and new knowledge creation in history with vast opportunities to benefit the world. Uh, in a keynote address, a couple of years ago for the main center for entrepreneurs i made a comment that it was nice to uh, that we could fill an auditorium for that event because in the early 1980s we could have a few of us could have just shared a bowl of popcorn at a local pub <laughs> so uh, this line of thinking about the benefits of better understanding the whole sector quickly led via governor mills to the state economist's office where i had the pleasure of meeting amanda rector uh, in a very short time, Amanda and her staff were able to put together a more comprehensive picture. And you'll see in the film, it's a very positive and hopeful picture. And, and one that we thought the main public should see and appreciate. Just picking up on the word uh, appreciate, I think it's also appropriate uh, to have this program serve as a tribute to the entrepreneurs who have created the sector. Uh, I think we all know that traditional sectors of the main economy have often been place-based in the sense that uh, businesses grew around natural resources such as fisheries, ocean commerce, forests, agricultural land, rivers, water power, recreation and tourism, etc. The tech sector we're discussing today has a very different origin. Uh, these are businesses located in Maine largely because the founders wanted them here. So we have a generation of pioneering entrepreneurs to thank for choosing to build this new sector of Maine's economy over the past couple of decades. Wonderful, David, thank you. And, and I, by the way, thank you for thinking ahead. Sometimes when we do these bicentennials, it's all about looking at the last uh, X amount of years, in our case, 200. But uh, I love the idea of using this opportunity to say, what's the next 100 years going to look like? And I appreciate the, that and endorsing, as you said, we have a strong tech, the sector uh, really began 
uh, with that handful of folks uh, eating popcorn in a bar, but it, it has grown tremendously. And I think, uh, I think that's uh, an inspiration for today's conversation. Before we introduce our panelists and delve into some questions, we are delighted to premiere David's latest film, Maine's Tech Economy at the Bicentennial. Hope you enjoy. As we celebrate Maine's Bicentennial, it's important to recognize that a new generation of entrepreneurial, technology-based companies has emerged over several decades to play a vitally important role in the state's economy. A thriving ecosystem of science-based ventures founded in Maine contributes significantly to the economic and cultural well-being of our communities today. Silicon Valley and Cambridge, Massachusetts are widely known examples of successful technology centers. The same modern science transforming those economies is driving a large and rapidly growing entrepreneurial technology sector of Maine's business community. Maine's tech economy now generates billions in revenues and thousands of new economy job opportunities. Businesses in this sector represent nearly 20% of Maine's gross regional product. It's important to recognize that the full economic impact of Maine's tech economy goes far beyond the revenues that those businesses generate. The purchases they make and wages they pay circulate further within Maine's economy, generating additional benefits for the people of Maine. This short video is intended as a tribute to the entrepreneurs who have created this thriving new economic base in Maine. Entrepreneurship is one of the most powerful forces in the world economy today, and Maine is a beneficiary of that same phenomenon. Building a company from the ground up is an adventurous and risky endeavor that requires highly dedicated and mission-driven teams to overcome daunting obstacles in their quest to create value in the world. In this bicentennial year, Maine is fortunate to have a growing community of these entrepreneurial teams. In recognizing the past generation of entrepreneurs, we hope to encourage the next generation of entrepreneurs. I hope that our collective accomplishments will help inspire others and help them envision what great looks like. Carpa manana. That was marvelous, David. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to share this film for the first time. Uh, let, me, uh, let me just hand it to you because we have some fabulous people with us today and I know you're anxious to, to briefly introduce them. So I'm gonna turn it right back to you, David. Thanks, Glenn. I'm grateful to have that opportunity to screen this film with audiences today. And I, I'd like to do, introduce a highly accomplished, or as we say in Maine, wicked good uh, panel members will provide their perspectives on uh, this important sector of Maine's economy. So Kim Hamilton is president of Focus Maine, a 10 year private sector led initiative to accelerate the creation of quality jobs in Maine by investing in three of our state's most globally competitive and high growth fields, uh, agriculture, aquaculture, and biopharmaceuticals. Kim is also a member of USM's board of visitors. Welcome Kim. Uh, Dr. Edison Liu is president and CEO of the Jackson Laboratory and a director of Jackson's NIH designated cancer center. Among his many degrees, uh, Dr. Liu holds an honorary doctorate of humane letters from USM, which he received virtually as part of an online commencement on May 9th of this year, so last month. Uh, Jax was very fortunate to convince Ed to relocate from Singapore to Bar Harbor, Maine to leading, lead our amazing genetics research institute. Welcome, Ed. Bob Metcalf <clears throat> is an engineer and entrepreneur who, who was an internet pioneer in the 1970s and co-inventor of Ethernet, an accomplishment that garnered him many awards, including the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers Medal of Honor and the National Medal of Technology and Innovation. He's also co-founder of 3Com, a multi-billion dollar networking company that's now part of Hewlett Packard. Uh, Bob is now based in Texas, but he has deep Maine roots. 
Welcome, Bob. Bob Nevue has been involved in Maine's tech sector for uh, Maine's tech startups for over two decades. So he founded, Bob funded Certify, a pioneering uh, cloud-based expense management software platform in 2008 and served as CEO until earlier this year. Welcome, Bob. Amanda Rector is the state economist for Maine. In this role since 2011, she conducts analyses of Maine's economic and demographic conditions to help inform policy decisions. She earned her master's in public policy and management from the Muskie School of Public Service here at USM. Barry Wark is the co-founder and CEO of Ovation, an exciting clinical informatics company here in Portland, providing operation software and data tools for next generation precision medical diagnostic labs. Welcome, Barry. Uh, welcome. And just a quick note uh, of thanks to Ovation, Jackson, Jackson Laboratories, and IDEX for playing important roles in COVID testing here in Maine. Thank you very much. So more detailed biographical information on the panelists will be posted by USM. I, I just add my thanks for, to everyone for joining and again to Libby and her team for a great job organizing this uh, seminar and turn the agenda back to Glenn to moderate our discussions. Thank you, David. Thank you, thank you for mentioning uh, how important the work that's been done on the testing. That is something much on our minds here at the university and the university system. And uh, I know uh, Ed and I have had a number of conversations about this, and uh, it couldn't be more important. So thank you for uh, for mentioning that, David. Well, we're going to start with uh, Amanda. Uh, and uh, as uh, as a state economist, you're directly engaged uh, with ongoing analysis of Maine's economic and demographic conditions and using this data to help inform your policy, as David had said. How do you see the growth of technology as a, a, a labor or economic sector in Maine? How, how has it uh, emerged and what do you see the trends uh, for the, the immediate future? Thank you, Glenn. You know, I, I would say that the importance of technology in Maine's economy is probably very often understated. Clearly, there are the direct contributions from the companies in the tech sector itself, what people think of when you say tech companies. Um, this includes both the big ones like IDEX um, and all the small startups that people maybe can't name but know are there. <laughs> but uh, the importance of technology really goes far beyond the, um, the admittedly billions of dollars that uh, these companies contribute to the economy. Um, they create a culture and environment of entrepreneurship um, and a density that lets further technologies blossom. So these companies are frequently operating in the global marketplace. And those widespread interactions that they have around the world, they're raising awareness of Maine, um, potentially attracting more businesses and people to the state, of which I'm incredibly uh, thankful for in my role as state economist. Um, and technology itself plays a big role in sectors that people don't typically think of, um, everything from boat building to agriculture and forestry. Even our traditional industries include tech companies now. Amanda, we're not seeing any plateauing. Uh, I, uh, my, my intuitive or in, uh, anecdotal information says this, is, this has been growing consistently and, it, and, it's, uh, and it's projected to do so in the future. Is that, is that accurate? That's my gut instinct, but does the, do the numbers support that? You're right. I mean, a lot of these businesses end up in um, what we call the professional and business services sector. Um, that's the, the uh, industry classification that they show up in. And that really has been one of the sectors that has seen some of the most robust growth over the years and is projected to continue growing, both in terms of employment count and in terms of the contributions to the state's gross domestic product. Wonderful. Well, speaking of those sectors, we have with us Kim Hamilton. As mentioned, she is the leader of Focus Maine, and they invest in some of those sectors, agriculture, uh, aquaculture, bi uh, biopharmaceuticals. Kim, uh, uh, expanding on kind of where uh, Amanda has laid the, the foundation, what role do you see emerging around technology uh, playing in your particular areas of focus and, uh, and focus Maine, and how will it impact Maine's future? Thanks, Glenn. I wanted to thank both you and David for hosting this conversation and for having a forward-looking discussion about the role of technology in our 
entrepreneurship. And to pick up on a couple of things, uh, themes that Amanda just put on the table, when we created Focus Maine, the idea was, could we create jobs in high growth export sectors? Um, so get more of those goods and services and products that that are created in the state and export them outside of the state. And I think what we're seeing is the role of technology and entrepreneurship has been you know, essential to the growth of these sectors. So when we look in particular you know, at agriculture, aquaculture, and biopharmaceuticals, you know, we didn't know when we selected those sectors just how resonant they would be at this particular moment. So just yeah, to I, make I, this- I just, Let me just say, Great work on that, by the way. When it first came out about five years ago, I was like, well, is that really? And then suddenly the world just, uh, you know, with the Rue Institute and the work that already existed here, I said, wow, they really got this right a few years back. Uh, so congrats. Yeah, I, I, I won't take any credit for predicting COVID, but I'm very glad we're in the <laughs> sectors that we're in right now. Um, but, I, you know, just to make it real, I think what we're seeing in the, the food economy, so ag and aquaculture right now, is this tremendous interest in technologies that are shortening the supply chain, so making it easier to get food directly from producers to consumers. Um, something similar in terms of creating platforms that allow farmers and producers producers to aggregate their food and make supply more predictable for consumers. And then while this isn't new technology, I think one of the things we're seeing are, you know, people really leaning into existing technologies that they may not have been using. So really looking at how do we, how do we market differently and market to um, new consumers and into new markets. So using some of that marketing technology in the food economy. And I just say on the, um, on the biopharma side obviously that is you know at, at, at you know at its very essence a technology play and in that particular space we think there's an incredible opportunity for Maine to you know tell a much stronger more coherent story about what's happening in the state and to really put Maine you know on the map because as Amanda said you know, there are big companies, there are small companies, and we think we have an opportunity to really elevate all of that and to create a space for more companies to move into Maine. And so technology is really, you know, a critical play there. That's a really, that's a perfect lead in, by the way, to Bob Nevu. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Bob, uh, as you know, many people outside of Maine tend to think of Maine more natural resources, tourism and hospitality. They don't see us as a place where tech can grow, and yet you have certainly uh, you know, buck that uh, unfortunate image. Tell us about what it's been like for you and how you were able to uh, get a foothold here in Maine uh, from a technology point of view and, and maybe your thoughts on how we could change that image uh, as, uh, as I think David uh, is mentioned earlier. Glenn, thanks for having me, and David, thanks for the invite as well. I'm, I'm super happy to be here talking about the experiences I've had in the last 20 years trying to build technology teams here in Maine. Um, it's, it's really been a very interesting journey, you know, the, the, uh, it's evolved over time, needless to say, but I think what we continue to find is some of the big questions are, can you find the right talent to really run a tech company in Maine? Can you find, can you develop the talent? Can you develop the people? Can you build a business? Can you find financing? Um, all the typical types of ideas that you would say are San Francisco, Silicon Valley, New York City, the answers there are, yeah, of course. And the question is, can you really thrive in Maine and do that? And, and I think we've proven, you know, through several uh, investments and, and growth of companies that we can actually do that. And we can do that quite effectively here in Maine. Uh, in many ways, I really see Maine as, as a strategic advantage to us. Um, we end up with a workforce that is extremely pleased and happy to be on board with a tech company. Um, and they're beholden to the organization um, to be to be quite selfish, if, if you will, as, as a founder and, and a CEO, the people tend to stay with you because there's not a lot of other great tech companies to jump to. Now, there are more. They're growing. The competition for talent is starting to heat up here in Maine, which is good. I think it's actually quite healthy. But, um, you know, when you bring people on board and you say, look, I'm not going to require you to have 10 years of software development experience. I'm going to train you. I'm going to support you. I'm going to invest in you. I'm going to help you build your knowledge base to create a better platform for our, for our end users. Um, and, and, and create that type of culture that, you know, people really want to be a part of, it becomes really very powerful. Um, we had a, we had a visitor, uh, join us a few years ago, Steve Case, the founder of AOL was doing a tour in Maine 
and he stopped by the office and I was really flattered because he's a super nice guy, but he said, you know what, this company could be in, in Silicon Valley. It's, it's everything about it is, is top notch. And that to me was a real sort of endorsement for the way we built the team, built the people, created culture and, and encouraged everyone to be the best they can while we build out technology that scales around the globe. Well, and, and that's, a, that's a nice validation for a, a major international leader in the tech uh, industry that uh, we, we can, in fact, make it. And uh, we can do some of the exact same things that are done in other areas of the world that are considered more uh, you know, tech uh, enclaves. Uh, Ed Liu, I think it's fair to say that Jackson Labs has long been regarded as a, uh, a global leader in genetic research in, in uh, no small part uh, thanks to your leadership. Well, where do you see uh, within the genomic uh, solution space that you're so deeply involved in, where do you see technology moving in the next few years? And uh, any thoughts about how we can even strengthen uh, your ability to, uh, to take advantage of those technologies? First of all, genomics is no longer a separate entity. It's now suffused um, completely in the fabric of uh, everything that we do. Um, and in fact, uh, you can't even consider a bio biopharmaceutical enterprise without a genomics and computational biology framework. So um, uh, the, the key role of Jackson Laboratory in the ecosystem of, um, of the life sciences in um, a life science industry in um, in Maine, I think it's going to be uh, growing uh, ever so more uh, in the next few years, next next decade. I'll give you uh, just a, a few examples. You know, as a not for profit, we actually bring in estimated about six hundred and fifty million dollars of traded industry uh, activity to the state of Maine. Um, and on top of that, we are the number one, um, have number one market share in North America for the provision of research mice and services. And we've exceeded $100 million in NIH grants, uh, which um, accounts for uh, over 75% of all NIH grants to the state of Maine. Um, what we have done is have done spinoffs, uh, but the spinoffs have been in California and in Boston primarily because the investors want those companies to be there. Um, I think what my, uh, my observation is that Maine has a tremendous opportunity. Uh, it's going to be, however, in localized places and in areas that we already have uh, strengths. And those strengths are going to be around the, the core of veterinary sciences, which IDEX, uh, Covetris, and, and, um, um, uh, and, and Jackson Labs have provided. And that is the nucleus that will expand into the biopharma uh, space. And when, when the Rue Institute and um, UMaine are really gearing up to be in IT, that's precisely where I think we're going to be. Because... Everything we're doing at the Jackson Labs is vectored towards uh, artificial intelligence and high-end computational um, resources. So when you add lifestyle, and if you add the hopefully an expansion of broadband, I think Maine uh, can be a, a real competitor, especially in the life sciences AI interface. Interesting. Thank you. You know, that, that's exciting. And it, it correlates a lot to what we heard from Kim Hamilton and some of the others. And certainly the UMaine system that already uh, both UMaine and USM have already uh, signed contracts with the Rue Institute to move our, our students on a clear pathway right into the, their programming. So I think we'll see even a, a greater number of graduates in these areas. So that's very, very encouraging. Uh, Barry, uh, given Ovation's commitment to bring innovative tests to the patients who need them, I, I can't help but think about Maine's uh, rural communities. How do you see technology impacting health services for those with limited access, especially uh, in an international pandemic? Um, any thoughts about uh, how Ovation can, uh, can help and what Maine needs to do to push the technology sector uh, into, into the into rural areas, but particularly access to the rural areas uh, through technology. Well, Glenn and David, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. As, as you know, as you just described, uh, access to uh, precision medicine is a big challenge nationwide, uh, and it's particularly acute in rural communities. Um, so the mission of Ovation is, is, as you said, to bring precision diagnostics and precision medicine, make it available to all patients. 
Uh, and one of the ways we're succeeding in this mission is by helping to democratize the ability to run those precision diagnostics in more labs and in more settings. So in the current environment, this means providing the lab operating software to help establish diagnostic labs, add new testing capabilities, and very quickly be able to bring up infectious disease diagnosis uh, workflows, uh, for example, uh, COVID-19 testing. Um, our technology is also helping provider offices and clinics add on-site testing. Uh, we're helping colleges and universities adapt research labs uh, for screening and diagnosis of students coming back to campus. Uh, and we're helping employers manage the massive testing needs of, of getting employees back to work and back to the office. And these are all with on-site testing facilities, remote testing facilities, or uh, you know, even home collection. All of these require operating software to make all of that happen, uh, to manage the logistics and, and uh, the laboratory operations. And that's where Ovation comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the great opportunities of leverage of technology is you can use it to drive opportunity into, into more places. Um, I want to emphasize we're not alone in this mission. Uh, it's been mentioned today already, but uh, we should recognize the incredible efforts of Maine's biomedical community in general. Um, the Maine CDC, IDEX, Abbott, uh, Maine Health, Intermed, and, and many others are mobilizing to address this, this global pandemic in, in you know, myriad ways and, and doing an incredible job in the state. Well, I, I have to say probably yesterday alone, uh, three or four hours related to testing, logistics, and protocol were on my agenda and on my Zoom call. So uh, I, uh, I appreciate all the work that Ovation is doing. Thank you very, very much yeah. for that. And thank, thank you, you for reaching out into as somebody who was not born in the, uh, the central uh, in downtown Portland, uh, but in more in the rural areas of Maine, I'm deeply grateful. Bob Metcalf, uh, you're an inventor, you're an engineer, you're an internet pioneer working outside the state of Maine. Um, can you comment on how Maine compares to other locations around the country with successful tech uh, economies? And, and what can Maine learn from those other places that you're also, you, that you personally are very familiar with? Well, I've been coming to Maine since the 60s. I played tennis and used to come to Maine and get beaten routinely by a guy named Jock McKernan, who was a <laughs> former Dartmouth varsity player. But then in 84, my company went public and we took a uh, sabbatical on a windjammer cruise out of Rockland and that began our uh, history in Maine and South Thomaston, Mouse Head, uh, Greens Island, Lincolnville. But since I had taken a, a, a company public, I was invited to these, these uh, entrepreneurship weeks that are held annually down in Portland. And uh, I was there in the very early days where we couldn't even afford popcorn we would just meet at the bar but without the popcorn uh, so I'm a uh, professor of uh, free enterprise and my model uh, is that uh, freedom and prosperity are the goals and innovation is what links them together in a virtuous cycle freedom generating prosperity and prosperity generating freedom uh, and startups are the machinery of free enterprise. That is being able to start a company and all the infrastructure of the economy. Uh, that's the machinery of free enterprise. And that's what I teach at the University of Texas. Uh, so here's, here's the four, three or four things that um, uh, weighed heavily in the long history of Silicon Valley, uh, which I take to be the, so the, epitome of the innovation economy. Uh, first is an accident. The reason Silicon Valley is in Santa Clara County, California, is because a man named Shockley went to MIT, went to Bell Labs, invented the transistor, and then went home. He had been raised in Palo Alto. So suddenly Shockley Semiconductor gave birth to all the entire semiconductor industry and Silicon Valley became Silicon Valley. So that's sort of like David Shaw being born in uh, Maine is one of those accidents of history that begins the, the growth of a, um, of a high-tech economy. Uh, another key, f getting to your question, another key factor is the research universities. Uh, in all the cases I'm familiar with, uh, high-tech startups uh, are frequently born first generation or second generation out of a nearby research university, Silicon Valley, of course, Stanford and Berkeley. Uh, at, in Austin, where I currently practice, we have the University of Texas and Texas A&M and Rice and so on, research universities generating deep innovations that startups can uh, grab and run with. 
Uh, we also have role model. Now the reason Silicon Valley has been around for more than 50 years, so you can't create uh, a, uh, a human capital at a, on a time scale much shorter than that. So it takes decades to build up a, an ecosystem and having role models uh, is a big help. So when it came time for me to start a company, I, I was surrounded by people who had started companies and knew how to do it, uh, the role models. And so uh, events like that annual gathering in Portland of entrepreneurs is very important in showing the role models to the, to the community. And finally, there's the, there's the beauty of the scenery and the weather. Mm. Uh, Palo Alto likes to exaggerate all the reasons why it's, you know, the heart of Silicon Valley. But frankly, it's the weather. The temperature rarely goes between out of 69 to 73 degrees. Maine, of course, has the same advantage. The beauty of Maine is a, a big attractor to people. It's why you would want, why most people are motivated to do things in Maine. It's because it's so beautiful here. And, and, and the temperature stays right between negative three and negative eight. You know, it's perfect. So. Well, that's a detail. See, Austin has a similar problem. We have beautiful weather in Austin, except in August where it hits 110 degrees every day. Uh, so uh, let me close with uh, mentioning the importance of critical mass. That is, what, what ecosystems struggle to do is achieve a critical mass. And uh, Maine has a great opportunity. Well, that critical mass means that USM and uh, Orono shouldn't be competing. Uh, they should be cooperating. They should be part of a network with the Jackson Labs. And then that network should, especially post-COVID, gets all the way to Portsmouth. But wait, it goes beyond Portsmouth to Boston. And frankly, if you do this right, that is have the attitude of networking, connecting things to build critical mass, then the ecosystem blossoms. So I think uh, Maine can get all, all the way to Austin and even Silicon Valley in its ecosystem networks. Let me end with that. Build critical mass through connectivity, especially. Those are, those are all that, that leadership, that culture, the critical mass, the importance of universities. Uh, and I, I think uh, uh, Mike Dubiak, the founder of uh, one of the founding uh, CEOs of WEX, or right, originally Right Express, uh, you know, his, his contribution to USM and creating that innovation at Technology Center is, uh, is a statement exactly in line with what uh, Bob just laid out, which is that we will have to be both innovative and disruptive in the way we think and completely agree that we, we need to be in alignment as, um, as, a, as a state with making sure the capital is here, making sure that the support is here for these organizations uh, that are these startups. Uh, let me let me just now, if it's okay, I'm going to just ask uh, a question, and hopefully uh, you will pop on and uh, and answer uh, some of those questions if you feel like you uh, you have some thoughts on that. So let me start off with uh, first of all, many of the people that will be watching this uh, webinar are are doing so with a very keen interest in entering and being employed in technologically focused industries. What, what advice would any of you give to these individuals about how to break into these fields and how to position themselves for success, especially students, um, students here at USM, but in, in all schools, uh, looking ahead to, to their careers post-graduation? Uh, uh, does does a, a particular mindset or skill set uh, that you might recommend uh, be helpful and, and uh, advice that uh, any of you might offer as these individuals go out and try to add value to the tech sector? I'll start by saying an ownership mindset, uh, a, a mindset to change the world, a sense of insurgency and urgency uh, to do something really great and to ask and to have a sense of what great looks like. So that, that kind of adventurous rebel mentality, a breakthrough mentality is a critical asset in entrepreneurship. I just, I just got a book from a friend of mine called David Shaw that said uh, the importance of developing creative economy through disruptive leadership. Uh, so uh, being a little bit of a, a disruptor, uh, although I, I would say as an entry level employee, you might, you might want to hold back on uh, overall disruption, but, but the idea is to think in the larger picture, but how do you, how do you disrupt? So Any let me thoughts? quickly, yes, I'd like to add to that. I mean, so this, attitude about doing something great is fabulous, but right behind it, you need to know something. 
-hmm. You can't just aspire to be great. You need to know something. So when companies get started, the first question I ask is, what do you know? What do you know that's valuable that other people don't know so we can get started? So know something. Yeah, can I jump in on that? Um, the know something right now is um, quantit our quantitative skills. Um, you know, quite frankly, you know, we are moving into, a, in biology, a highly quantitative uh, sector. I include all of computational anything uh, as, as uh, quantitative. The other is work ethic. Uh, if you have somebody who's willing to spend extra hours because of the passion that David is talking about, with some element of quantitative skills, you don't have to be a math major. Um, that's where we really find um, I individuals uh, is succeeding regardless of what tasks that they're given. I would also just say embrace risk. Um, that is why I am an economist and not a tech entrepreneur because I'm a little more risk averse, but I think that that's a really important piece of um, successful entrepreneurship is embracing risk. Wonderful. And you know, Glenn, if I could just chime in with a thought, not all tech companies are 100% technology employees, right? If you look, if you look at Certify, you know, we ended up with literally millions of users of our expense product around the globe. And about 25% of our staff are actually involved in building that product. Mm -hmm. The rest of the staff are in sales and marketing and customer success and all of the other pieces, <clears throat> implementation, training, you know, et cetera. And those are fantastic jobs to get into uh, a tech organization. You don't have to necessarily be technology or technologically inclined, the ability to write code, et cetera, um, to, to embrace this economy and be a part of it. Yeah, the definition, I like, I like what Bob said. What do you know? And somebody might say, I know accounting. Uh, somebody might say, I know marketing. I know distribution uh, systems. And somebody hopefully will be able to say, I know coding. Uh, I know uh, the genomic uh, space, et cetera. So uh, very helpful. Let's just keep picking up on that. So another level of entry into this business is a little bit more scary, which is becoming an entrepreneur. This is something, obviously, David and Bob and, and uh, Bob and Bob all jumped in and really entered and Barry too entered that space of just uh, taking a big risk uh, and and moving into a space where they were going to put it all on the line and try a company. What advice do you have for those individuals who you know have some skills in this area, have some knowledge, uh, now want to maybe break out of a larger company or maybe just uh, want to enter into uh, uh, a, into that entrepreneur startup phase uh, where they would actually be the owners. And David talked about the owner mentality. In this case, the question is what, what happens when you are the owner uh, and that you're taking that big risk? Any advice for those individuals who are looking at those kind of options? I have some advice. I, I think you can't start a company alone. So you begin by selling yourself mm. on whether you know enough to get started in your company, but then you got to sell some co-founders, roughly speaking, to join you uh, because you can't build a company alone. And then one final thought is very often you need to bring in adult supervision. And Silicon Valley has lots of it, adult supervision sitting on the shelf for you to bring it, like Steve Jobs recruited Mike Markula to run his little company. Uh, so convince yourself, convince your co-founders and get started. Other, other ideas, recommendations for the entrepreneurial-minded? Uh, uh, well, I, I can jump in there. I, I, may be the, I may be the most recent of the, the folks to jump off the cliff here in, into, uh, into starting a company. Um, so I would say uh, entrepreneurship is an incredibly creative act. Uh, and uh, getting comfortable and, and enjoying that moment of discovering something that's broken in the world and deciding you want to fix it. Right, like that's the key moment and, and to what Bob said, right? Know what you know, and you know something is broken. Deciding how to make a business out of fixing it is, is a creative process. And to the point of, you know, the community here, there's a lot of folks around uh, the community here in Maine now already that can help you refine that idea into a business. Um, so, you know, advice is, don't believe that the status quo is, is, is there for a reason. Um, if you know th something is broken, uh, ask why and, and think about how you can fix it. And very often uh, solutions to problems 
uh, are valuable businesses as well. If I may, um, you know, the entrepreneur in terms of driving a new company tends to be uh, individual on the top with the capacity idea and the, um, the capital. But what I also have found is that an entrepreneurial company requires a staff who are remarkably flexible because a, a startup company, there's no fixed job, right? I mean, everybody has to roll up their sleeves and does a lot of stuff. Um, and one thing that we have found, uh, even at JAX, uh, because uh, over 35% of our staff don't have college degrees. In fact, it's up to 40%. And, um, um, and what the key component is that we've really invested in the education of our, of our workers, identified those people who are the most flexible and the most uh, able to learn. It, it doesn't matter how they got started as long as they're willing to learn and be flexible. And that has gave us returns in spades uh, because when we needed to turn on a dime, like when we stood up our COVID-19 um, program, to 20,000 tests a day um, at, the, at the middle of July. It, it was made from people who've never done um, viral testing. And uh, everybody was just sufficiently flexible uh, and willing to take that risk, that internal risk that um, Barry and Bob are talking about um, to really do something good. Amanda said, embrace the risk. I would say, embrace the struggle. <laughs> know it's a struggle, embrace the struggle, and, and learn from the struggle and become wise and, and resourceful uh, through the struggle. I just, I just want to say I saw a great image of David Shaw jumping off a boat in Antarctica into the Ar Antarctic Ocean, and I thought that's a great metaphor for uh, these <laughs> entrepreneurs and what they're up to. You've got to just kind of take the leap and uh, take the struggle of the, or at least the pain of the temperature. <laughs> that's known as the polar plunge, 27 <laughs> degrees. Uh, Bob, you were going to say something. Yeah, very similar. I think, you know, you have to be all in. If you're, if you're going to truly run a company, you're really going to do this. You got to, <laughs> David, David leads the way by jumping into the polar plunge. <laughs> so you have to be all in. And, you know, a, a side comment, um, I think it's really important to hire good people. And when I say good, that, that, that word may mean knowledgeable or experienced, but it also just generally inherently good people. If you hire good people and you take care of that team, the team will take care of the business. And I've always, I've always bet on good people and that's worked well. Well, and I just wanted to loop, loop back to your first question and bridge it to this one. One word that hasn't come up here that I observe in entrepreneurial is just sort of unending curiosity. And so when I think about kind of bringing students along, right, in the work that you're doing in the centers that um, USM has, you know, how do you continue to cultivate that creativity, the adaptability, but also this idea that, you know, there's got to be a strong core center of interest and a driving, you know, a driving passion here. And those strike me as very soft skills, but really critical to underpinning kind of an entrepreneurship environment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for emphasizing that. It is something that as we change our pedagogy here and throughout much of higher education to case-based, inquiry-based challenges, rather than here's the textbook, memorize this, get this. Not that there aren't some cases where you simply have to get the uh, the base of the fundamentals down pack, but, but what we're trying to move is to Here's a real world challenge. This is, you know, if you were going to be the state economist, here's what she wakes up to every morning. How are you going to handle that problem? If you're uh, ovations and you're trying to uh, enter a rural space and it's, uh, and it's difficult, how do you go about it? What's the challenge? And those case studies and those kind of inquiry-based education that we're trying to move towards, I think, sets the stage for curiosity. Uh, it emphasizes creativity, which many, and flexibility. Uh, and quite frankly, some comfort level with ambiguity, because many of us in academics like to have the answer is X and I am right. And that doesn't play well, I think, in some of the space. So. So how does remoteness impact that? Mm. We're going to be know, much more remote than we used to be. That's right. And, and, and what we're thinking about right, right now in higher education, for example, is that w there's some evidence that says you actually learn better in the online space. Uh, in part because you actually have to show your work rather than just seat time. 
uh, which is uh, which is antithetical to really uh, certainly the entrepreneurial spirit. So what we what we're seeing is that if it's done well, however, let me caveat by saying on the one to ten continuum. Uh, I'm not saying our university, but some universities have professors all the way along that one to 10 uh, continuum, meaning really high performance, innovative online remote that really gets the best out of people. And then some closer, a little bit still to the, uh, here are a couple of my videos, you fill out this paper and send it back to me. So, so we're working to push everybody up along that continuum of using the new tech uh, remote space in a more creative way. So let me uh, let me conclude. I think we are we're we're just about out of time here. I, I want to thank all the panelists. I'm going to turn it over to David for the final word. Uh, but I want to thank you for giving your time, your expertise. I certainly learned a lot. And thank you for uh, being engaged here today with the main tech economy at the bicentennial. Uh, what the next hundred years might look like. It was uh, really, truly wonderful to hear everybody's perspective. And David, I want to thank you personally for putting this together and putting together uh, truly an amazing uh, body of knowledge through these uh, wonderful panelists. I just want to thank you. And David, uh, final words. Thanks for uh, joining and co-hosting this. It's, it's great to have uh, USM as a partner in this program in supporting the tech economy. I'll, I'll underline what <laughs> Bob Metcalf said, having research universities, there's virtually no success stories of of meaningful scale uh, in the world where where a tech economy uh, doesn't have a, a an important research institution nearby. So, um, could you take a minute and 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 talk? Would you like to take a minute and, and talk about what some of those capabilities are at USM? Yeah, thank you, and, and thank you, uh, thank you, David, for your help. Uh, David has been a terrific uh, intellectual force here, <laughs> thinking about innovation, disruption. And I want, also want to say thank you to Kim uh, Kim Hamilton, who's on our board of visitors, who's been a, uh, an enormous portal to us to the tech sector uh, as my, as well as other sectors. Um, the the Dubiac Center for Innovation and Digital Sciences, which uh, we established two years ago, in his name uh, and his uh, original. Uh, uh, grants that he gave to the university to get that started has uh, germinated into a number of what we call innovation, what we call the MIST lab, uh, which is designed for students to come in and try experiments uh, that include biochemistry. Uh, we uh, and of course our combination of our engineering and digital sciences together. Uh, uh, for example, we have been uh, rapidly producing PPE gear for the COVID crisis and uh, shipping them uh, across the world uh, as uh, through our 3D printing and, and those kind of innovative spaces. And those are designed by students and a professor together, uh, uh, obviously following some uh, basic guidelines by the CDC. So those are the kind of examples of where we want to go and further develop. Um, and the Rue Institute obviously offers a nice correlation for us because uh, we can move our students directly after three years, uh, as early as three years, into their master's program and they can leave that uh, program with a master's degree after four or four and a half years or four years in the summer. So those are the kind of, kind of what we're trying to set up the, uh, the creative spaces on campus, uh, the kind of entrepreneurial spirit on campus. And we're linking together our business program with our engineering program and digital science program so that the entrepreneurship can also get the, the kind of basic business expertise that you need to be able to start your own company or to be successful within a company. So thank you for that uh, a chance to make a, a small commercial, but uh, more importantly, I wanted to say thank you to everybody uh, from, uh, from here at USM for being part of this. And David, thank you for, for considering that. Thank you all for everything you've done. Uh, Bob, thank you for uh, ethernet. That's helpful to all of us. You're welcome. <laughs> and thank you, uh, everyone else, for all your contributions. Um, I, I, I'll just underline the, this importance of critical mass. Uh, I, I think we're starting to get there, at least in southern Maine and, and, and maybe a couple of other places. And I guess the last thing I would say is, is I think part of, of, of critical mass is campus. And, and, and I, I think to really thrive, uh, uh, typically uh, public entities help create uh, campus environments for 
high tech entities. I think Maine has not done a great job of that. I, hopefully, that's one of the next things we can do is to is to create a uh, a campus for these place based place based enterprises uh, and and further drive critical mass. So, and finally, thank you, Amanda Rector, for being the star of our film. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Well, thank you, David, for your uh, your foresight on this topic and for bringing the vision of today's uh, discussion to life. Um, this program has been a great service, I hope, to the, the citizens of Maine. I also enjoy uh, your cinematography and I'm delighted that uh, we're able to virtually premiere your latest films, uh, or film at USM. Uh, and to our audience, thank you for joining us here today for this important program. Uh, we here at USM take great pride in educating students who enter the fields of technology, health sciences, and health data analytics, and serving as an incubator for not only human capital, but also strategic partnerships that uh, yield growth and progress for the people of Maine. Thank you again, and we appreciate everybody's uh, listening, and we appreciate again our great panel and David Shaw for founding this uh, seminar today.